it's been a little while since I have done a sci-fi timeline, so I figured it was time to dip back in. And, and this is one that I swear I put on my schedule like about three times and then removed it. So, so I'm happy to finally be getting to it. And we're talking about the Stepford Wives, a, a term that has now surpassed the source material. Like if you say that someone is acting like a Stepford wife, you know exactly what they mean, even if you've never seen the films. And, and there's a whole series. So let's take a look and see if their continuity is as perfect as the ladies themselves. Our Wedded Bliss begins back in 1975 with The Stepford Wives, which was based on a novel of the same name. The beginning has Elaine Robinson, and her and her husband and kids are moving out of the big city and heading to Stepford. They arrive at their new house and feel out of sorts with being in a quieter area. Very quickly, they notice the odd behaviors of the women in town, and when there's a car accident, everyone springs into action and acts peculiar, particularly because one of them is a Harkonnen, and they take the crash victim in the opposite direction of the hospital. One night, Walter goes to an initiation for the Stepford Men's Association and comes home visibly upset but secretive. And Joanna soon meets Paula Prentice as Bobby, who has also just moved to town, and the two bond really quickly. The men's group is run by a guy named Diz, and they have a meeting in which someone draws her picture while she sits there. They witness one of the wives having a minor meltdown and repeating the same thing over and over, and they try to start their own women's group. But the only one that seems interested is Ginger, and they find out that at one point, Stepford was called one of the most liberal towns around, and the women there interested in progressive social causes, and now suddenly are far more conservative and only want to be homemakers. Shortly after, Charmaine has completely changed temperaments and now fits in with the other wives, much to the dismay of Joanna and Bobby. They decide to check the water for chemicals and enlist an old flame of Joanna's named Raymond Chandler, and they mention the film Farewell My Lovely and ask if they've seen it, and that came out in 75, so we're likely in real time or after. They decide to move out and Walter actually agrees, but then suddenly Bobby is converted. At the end of her rope, Joanna goes to a psychiatrist and says that both Charmaine and Bobby changed after being in town for four months. And she's now been there four months and is told to get the kids and get out of town. And she tries, but her kids are gone. She goes to Bobby's house to see if they're there and gets the possibly shocking reveal the time but i mean i think we all know the score by this point and bobby is a robot she's lured in by a recording of her kids' voice but it's diz and he says that they found a way to replace their wives and it's perfect for everyone she encounters her own robot duplicate made using the picture references and voice recordings only she has black eyes and it kills her we then see Robo Charmaine, Robo Bobby, and the new Robo Joanna at the supermarket. Although there's a tinge in her eyes suggesting that it may possibly be the real Joe who was maybe able to escape. Anyway, there, there's no date given here, so we'll go with that one movie reference and say real time 75. A sequel arrived five years later on the small screen with 1980's Revenge of the Stepford Wives. It's still in Stepford and says that it's 10 years later, so I guess 1985? And there's a man who says that it's not working out and wants to leave town and decides to move. But as they're driving away, a police cruiser runs them off the road and kills them. Cagney comes rolling into town. I, I think, at least I think, it, I think it's Cagney, maybe Lacey? Uh, she's a TV reporter and doing a story on how Stepford has some of the lowest crime and divorce races, which is pretty silly. Like, since when does the absence of women equal less crime? The men's association is still in operation, and Diz is still in charge, although he's been recast. And oddly, although this is supposed to be 10 years later, he doesn't look significantly older. They're concerned about Kay's arrival and talk about converting her, and she notices that at certain times of the day, a siren sounds, and all the women take medication. 
She then meets a local couple, a cop and his wife, who are Detective Crockett and Marge freaking Simpson. Diz meets Kay, and Charlie from Lou Grant is on hand, but so is Mrs. Roper. Andy and Megan are new in town, and Diz is trying to get Andy into the men's club, but he says that no one is hurt, so it seems likely that they've changed their system, but he's still promising a perfect wife. We find out that the siren goes off four times a day, every day, and Megan is taken away on that weekend retreat that they do. Meanwhile, Kay gets some inside info from Wally, but then is attacked. But we find out that instead of the women being killed and replaced by robots, they are merely brainwashed, and the pills are to maintain their hypnotic state, and Megan is converted. We're told that they're not allowed to drink. But um, without alcohol, will she do what I, I want? Dude just told on himself big time right there. They go on the hunt for Kay, and she confronts Megan, having to knock her out. She gets rid of the pills, and the programming starts to break down. She eventually snaps out of it. When Megan is captured, Kay realizes that she has to do something, so they hold Diz at gunpoint and start sounding the siren over and over, which causes some chaos, and, and Andy switches sides. And yeah, sure, man. After the town is fighting back, sure. All the women show up to attack Diz and then just straight tear the guy apart. So, with no other confirmation, other than being 10 years later, I guess we're sticking with 85, five years into the future, when this was shot. That was followed up with another TV movie, but it took seven more years until 1987's The Stepford Children to arrive. It begins with a sign saying that Stepford was established in 1908, and we meet a very familiar sight, a very robotic woman. Then we bounce back to the big city as Jeannie and her husband and son prepare to move to Stepford. They're also worried about their daughter, but not because she might free the Wishmaster, but because she's hanging out with, oh no, not punks! Meanwhile, the Morelands take their son Kenny on a fishing trip, but whoops! He's one of those no-good punk hooligans, too. What's this world coming to? And holy cow, do you know how Kenny looks this way? I mean, it's because he puts on some makeup, turns on the tape deck, and puts the wig down on his head. Friggin' Dick Buckus is here, and the Men's Association is still in full swing, and they drug Kenny. Meanwhile, the Hardings move into their new house, and they're always arguing, and as opposed to everyone taking the train to work like in the last film, now they all ride a bus together. At the school, all the kids are clearly dupes, and this guy is a teacher, and, and sure I recognize him from bigger stuff, like he was in Murder by Death and Holy Moses and stuff, and, and I hate that the first thing that I said was, oh hey, it's the devil from Hunk. Steven gets recruited into the boys club, and we find out that he lived there once before and had a previous wife. Young David starts a relationship with Lois, and we're told that Stephen's previous wife died 18 years ago. And in a hilarious scene when they're doing an awards presentation, Laura stands up and starts challenging the principal on their education standards, which I guess, like in the context of the film, makes sense. But man, does she kind of come off as a Karen here with a haircut to match? The kids then cause a scene at the school dance by putting on some rock music, which causes the other kids to turn violent, just, just like my mom always said would happen if I kept listening to the devil's ear candy. And later, when the young couple tries to escape, they get into an accident, and Lois is hospitalized and converted to a robot dupe. Shortly after, Stephen takes Mary on a shopping trip and comes back Stepfordized, and we see Dad's former wife's gravestone, which says that she died in 1968. Since they earlier said that she died 18 years ago, that would make this 1986, just one year after the time frame of the last one. While investigating, Laura finds Mary still alive and strapped to a table. Not, not sure why they kept her alive, but okay. And the new robots are these advanced sort of biobots. And the family escapes, blowing everyone up in the process, and, and they flee town. Now, here's the thing. The events of the previous film are never mentioned and there doesn't seem to be any fallout from the finale of that one. So there's two possibilities. One is that the ending of that isn't as happy as it seems, and that Kay and Megan either didn't get away, or no one believed them, and the men were able to get the wives back under control, 
and then realized that going back to the robot duplicates was more manageable. Or that film never happened, and this is a direct follow-up to the first one. Like, either works, but the second seems more likely given the one-year gap between that one and this one. And may the everlasting thread of continuity forever bind the Harding family to Stepford. Oh yeah, because those are so strong here. Everything then went quiet until 1996 when things got reversed in another TV movie called The Stepford Husbands. The beginning has a man shooting his wife with a shotgun, and then has one of the Ewings, along with her husband, Sheriff Truman. And he's an author, but having troubles, and were set around Christmas. In an effort to save their marriage, they move to Stepford, where her old friend Shirley lives with her husband. She says he had a breakdown last year, but is much better now, and they go to a women's group meeting headed up by Nurse Ratchet. They notice that men in town are very docile, and I guess, I guess I'll mention that even though it's supposed to be a small town, like a really small town, in every film it looks completely different just based on shooting them in different areas. Mick bonds with his neighbor, who has also just moved there, and he gets drunk and comes home to shout at Jody. So she goes to consult with Dr. Ursa. Later, Mick's new friend attempts a suicide, but then comes back from the hospital a changed man, of course. At an event, Mick is given champagne that seems to have an effect on him, and he's forced into recovery service treatment. And there's a different tactic here, in that it seems that some wives aren't even aware of the whole process, as Jody is kept in the dark about what is happening to her husband. It seems like they're back to a brainwashing technique instead of robot replacements. And Mick returns home, and she notices the changes immediately. He has to take a bunch of medications, and Jody finds out that the intro killing was in their house. Although the newspaper article is about NATO for some reason, and we see that happened in December of 1995. Since this takes place a short while after, but likely into the new year, we're in real time 96. Jody starts to put it all together and swaps out the drugs that they gave him, which makes him violent. She's able to get through to him though, and the town rounds them up, so Jody decides to bust him out. Miriam says things went wrong before and it turned out alright, and I suppose that it's possible she may be talking about the other movies but I think it's more likely she's referring to the intro incident. And the doc is against trying to kill people, so she uh, kill, kills Miriam instead. After saving Mick, they head back to New York, and this could easily be in continuity with any of the others. There's a near 10 year gap between this and the last one. So in that time, this new group has moved in, having heard about the previous incidents there and decided to start their own little agenda. Eight years later, it looked like it was remake time, and in 2004, there was The Stepford Wives from Frank Oz, which was a very troubled project. This one begins with a TV executive that looks like Virginia Woolf, and she has a new show about gender warfare hosted by Meredith Vieira, and another with Mike White and Billy Bush, who looks like someone you could uh, just, I don't know, talk about sexual assault with. Another incident with a wronged contestant tanks Joanna's career, so she is fired and has a breakdown. Her husband is Godzilla's greatest foe, so they decide to get away to Connecticut with their two kids and move to Stepford. They're greeted by the Nova Prime, and their house is a smart home with a, a CGI robot dog? We're told that the town has no crime, or poverty, and of course, there's a men's association, and the women of the town are very idyllic. It's the 4th of July, and Winifred is here, along with her husband and uh, Tommy Flanagan. Yeah, that, that's it. That, that, that's the ticket. It's clear that they're not yet converted, and they see one of the wives glitch. So they call in the evil Archangel Gabriel. Wow. They find a remote control for one of the wives, but don't quite realize it, and Walter witnesses a wife being used as an ATM and is welcomed to the club. Joanna makes a gay friend who infiltrates the association, and he's caught, and Joanna soon starts investigating what's going on. She finds a news article about one of the wives, and it says that she joined a transglobal airline in 1992, and the company has grown over the course of those 12 years, which makes this at least 2004. 
And another article lists a different wife's career and it lists dates up to 2003. And oh, even the dog is a replacement bot. It turns out that they get Bobby too and she confronts the association and we get the reveal, which is different here. In this one, nanochips are put in their brains and as opposed to the guy being Diz because he used to work for Disney, Mike is named because he used to work at Microsoft. And uh, wait a minute, so, so they're not robots and they just have chips in their heads that control their actions? Does the chip make them able to withstand fire damage? How about spinning at the dance? Did the chip have a whole money out of your mouth function? We then see the Joanna bot and they put her in the machine and we cut to the supermarket scene from the ending of the original. But instead of an ending here, we see Walter at a big gala event for the town, but he sneaks down into the lab and basically shuts down the nano chips, which frees all the women in Stepford and they're understandably upset. They reveal that he never converted Joanna in the first place, but then we find out that Mike is actually a robot and everything was the work of Claire? She reveals her whole scheme to create a perfect society and then electrocutes herself. Six months later, Joanna has won six Emmys for her documentary about the incident. And hold up, hold up! It was like the 4th of July. So this would be like probably really early in the following year. So I guess like 05 now. But you're telling me that she had time to make a documentary about what happened. Get it funded, produced, shot, edited, and released. And they had an Emmy ceremony within that time frame. Because they're not saying it was nominated. It one out of everything in this film that's the least believable the men are made to stay in the town and, and serve their wives now the way that they were made to do so there was also a tv series in 2014 called secret lives of stepford wives but it's not about robotic women or hypnotic suggestion or whatever uh, it's just a true crime show about a seemingly perfect women in a neighborhood and the secrets they're keeping it, it just borrows the title with the concept of a place that's perfect on the surface but has a dark side. That also applies to a 2017 show called Stepford Side Chicks, which I really wish was the title of an official entry because that actually sounds awesome, but it's not a part of the series, nor does it use the overall concept. So there you have it, five movies that, um, yeah, don't have a lot of continuity in here. Um, none of them are really tied to the other ones. There's no sort of continuing storyline that goes through all of them. Each one of them can be watched separately. The only recurring character out of any of them is Diz appearing in the first and second movies. But again, he really makes no mention of the first movie's contents at all. So it can be seen as its own separate things. And these are mostly pretty entertaining. It's kind of the same thing over and over and over again. None of these are really that outstanding with the exception of the original, which even now when you're watching it, you know it was built on this twist, but you everyone knows the twist. So it's kind of it's kind of hard to get into because like you know everything that's gonna come. But it's still a darn good flick. And uh, you know, the other ones are just entertaining. Um, I did not care for the remake much at all. I find it to be pretty, pretty bad. But for most of the other ones were at least fun and silly in that kind of goofy TV movie way. I don't know. Let me know what you think of these down below. I want to hear it. Let me know what you think of this video by hitting the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of the channel by hitting the subscribe button and getting information about when new videos are coming out. You can also go to patreon.com slash movie timelines and help support this channel and keep it going. You can just keep on coming back and watching. I appreciate that as well. And I'll see you very shortly for another great episode. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.